All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for our, our annual church meeting. Uh, my name is Ken O'Brien. I'm currently serving as your church chair, and we'll go ahead and officially open the meeting. I'm going to ask Sterling Moore, the campus pastor of this, the Mill Creek campus, to open us in prayer. Sterling? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you... Um, even today, as we've talked about the importance of remembering the opportunity just to look back and to think over the last 12 months and beyond and see the ways that you have moved and worked in the life of the church. And God, our, our hearts are grateful. Um, and Lord, we pray for your continued guidance and your leadership. Um, we pray for the leadership of this church that you would continue to impress upon them the vision that you have for this community of believers that we would grow in the work of transformation and the impact of the gospel. Be with us in this place. Go before us. Meet us here, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So how many of you, this is your first time to the Mill Creek campus? A couple of folks? Great. Well, we chose to have it out here just for you. <laughs> All right. Appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, the meeting is officially called to order. I do want to go ahead and establish a quorum. We have 752 members. We're required to have 15% of those present or participating for a vote. Uh, that for any existing motion that's on the floor, which would include the EC membership, the uh, nominating committee membership, and the budget, we just need to have a 15% of 752 either voting uh, directly here in the room or voting online. We've established that quorum. For any changes to any motions on the floor, in other words, anyone proposes an amendment to a motion on the floor, we would need to have 115 people or 113 people present in the room to vote on those, and we have that quorum here established as well. So we can just vote all day long. So. <laughs> but we're not. Let me go ahead and cover the agenda for you so we can cover, uh, let you know what we're doing today. Already established the quorum. We're going over the agenda right now. We're going to start with the approval of the uh, meetings from the previous annual meeting, and then we will have uh, a review of the election of the EC and the nominating com committee membership. Then uh, Jeff will provide his report. Uh, that's the one that takes the longest. And then we'll have... Um, I said, I said that for Doug's benefit. If you remember, Doug's report last year was like three times. Anyway, uh, then um, Doug will be presenting uh, this year's financial report and the proposed budget for next year. And then we'll go into the official vote. So uh, moving forward. So I want to talk to you about the nominating committee and the uh, EC membership. Normally, Doug Walton, who is the uh, chairman of the nominating committee would come up and uh, preside over this purport, this portion of the meeting, but Doug and Lori are having some uh, wonderful time in Europe on vacation, so we'll be happy for them on that, and I'll go ahead and cover his section. So uh, basically, want to talk about uh, the, the EC nominees. The nominees can be recommended by the congregation, by the nominating committee, by uh, the executive staff, by executive council, uh, but then all of those names are turned over to the nominating committee that goes through a pretty intense vetting process, which includes interviews, it includes applications to uh, know, know that the individuals being uh, recommended fit the qualifications. Those qualifications are posted if you're interested in seeing what those are. Uh, then the nominating committee recommends the final candidates to you, the congregation, for an actual vote for EC membership. The EC uh, members serve a three-year term. It is limited to two successive terms, so a total of six years. You have to vote for each term, so first term and second term. And then the church officers are elected by the executive council every year, so they only serve a one-year term. So I uh, am serving this year's term as your EC chair, and then uh, we'll vote for new officers in September at our first EC meeting uh, in the start of the new ministry year. So the current church officers, just in case you didn't know, myself, our vice chairman is Frank Valentini. Is Frank in the room? Frank, right here, if you wouldn't mind standing up just so people can see you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Bates is our secretary. Chris, are you in the room? Back there waving in the back. Thank you, Chris. And then Doug Kite is our treasurer. All right. Thank you. Uh, this year, our candidates for executive council, we have four new candidates. Well, they're not all new. One of them is serving his second term. 
but new to the EC would be Tracy Barbel. And Tracy, I know you're here somewhere. Would you mind standing up? There's Tracy Barbel. Thank you. Um, Sean Glor. Sean, are you here? Oh, there you are. Thanks, Sean. And then uh, Mike Leone is uh, serving his, would be serving his second three-year term. Mike, are you in the room? Mike is not in the room. I saw him this week, so I know he's in town. Uh, and then uh, Tony Valenti. Tony uh, was actually brought on to the EC uh, to replace Dave Prost when he um, uh, retired or resigned from the EC. Uh, and so he was brought on, but he still has to be validated or confirmed by the congregation. So Tony is here as well. Tony, thank you. Okay, so those are your um, nominated executive council members. Um, we'll be voting on those later in the meeting after we go through the presentation of the budget proposal. On to the nominating committee. Nominate, nominating committee is seven members. The reason the nominating committee exists, it is a separate body that exists outside of the executive council to ensure objectivity in terms of uh, bringing nominations to the church for the executive council positions. There are four nominees that sit from the nominating committee itself. In other words, they're, they're brought in, elected at large, and then three nominee, uh, nominees from the executive council. And the reason for that in the establishment of the bylaws and the establishment of the committee is to at least provide some level of continuity year over year in terms of the EC membership. So that's the makeup of the nominating committee, and that committee is also voted on by you, the congregation. So this year, uh, each member, by, by the way, of the nominating committee serves for a one-year term. So we have to re-elect that nominating committee every year. There is no term limit on the nominating committee. Um, so this year you'll see the names. Some of them are repeats. Uh, Rusty Bland, Sherry Kirby, Chris Mason, uh, uh, Carrie Van Rosam, Doug Walton, who is the chair, Amy Wildman, and Nancy Wong. Okay, that is your membership today of your nominating committee. Um, and those are the nominees for the nominating committee for the next year. All right, any questions about any of that? That was pretty easy. Good? All right, again, we'll be voting on both of those uh, committees uh, here after the presentation of the annual budget. Um, I'd also at this time like to go ahead and ask our EC members if I could introduce them and make sure that they, you recognize who they are before we go into the pastor's report. I see Kim Erickson, if you wouldn't mind Kim standing up. And let's see, do we have other uh, executive council members here that you haven't met? Oh, Russ Crucial and Alan Duncan. I think I introduced everybody else. Oh, Scott, thank you, Scott Salvati. Could you stand up so everybody can see you, Scott? Thank you. That's your current EC membership along with the other individuals that we uh, nominated to you before. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Pastor Jeff for the pastor's report. Thank you, Ken. I don't know if that was a slam at me or at Doug or both <laughs> about the time, but we'll remember it. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here uh, at Mill Creek. It's fun to have our annual meeting here and see uh, if you were here for worship this morning, see what God is doing here. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Um, I had dinner with Scott Rideout this past week on Wednesday night. Scott's the president of Converge International, Converge, uh, our, our broader denomination. And uh, he reached out, he was in town for a meeting and he said, hey, I would like to have dinner if you're free. I said, sure. So. I asked him, uh, hey, what are you seeing? We had a good conversation about a number of things. I said, what are you seeing in church trends around the country that you deal with in our denomination and otherwise that would be helpful for us to know about, for me to know about? And he shared what he called five troubling trends of the church in America today. Uh, and I'll just read them off real quick and talk about a couple that would pertain to us. Not because they're troubling, but you'll, you'll understand, I hope. Number one, uh, a focus on growth over health is a troubling trend. Churches just only worry about getting bigger and not getting healthier. Number two, a focus on free agency over farm system. If you don't, aren't familiar with those terms, that's baseball terminology for where do you find your talent, internally or do you just go outside and sign free agents? And he said, there's nothing wrong with either one of those, but churches that are only just looking for the best so-and-so out there as opposed to trying to grow leaders from within, that's a troubling trend, and I agree with that. Number three, focus on retaining over sending, just keeping it all internal and not launching people out to serve other places. And these last two I want you to really pay attention to because this is what I want to talk about briefly. A focus on security over succession and a focus on defense over offense. 
Security over succession, meaning keeping the status quo other than thinking about who's next, whether that's at the senior pastor, lead pastor level, or any level. And the second, playing defense over offense, just protecting, defending what we have rather than trying to grow the kingdom and make a greater impact. When he said those last two, it really impacted me because I, I just had this profound gratitude that that's not been our story here at Chapel Street Church. That's not been true about us by God's grace. It was three annual meetings ago that we voted to transfer senior leadership from Pastor Brian to me. And that seems like a blink in some ways. It seems like an eternity in other ways, you know. That's pretty remarkable. And in those three years, before that certainly, but certainly in those three years as well, we've been anything but defensive as a church. We'll talk about that here in just a moment seeing what God has been doing over those three years. In fact, what I want to show you now is a brief video. You received this little handout as you walked in called Chapel Street uh, Ministry Impact by the Numbers. And numbers can get a bad rap. Um, this Numbers represent, they're, they're metrics of spiritual growth and health. And there are n a number of things to count. But you've got just a snapshot here. And we want to do more than just give you this. I want you to see visually uh, some more of the impact that God is making through uh, our church efforts uh, by the numbers. So we'll roll that. with you right now. They believe in you, but they have not surrendered. God, by your Holy Spirit, speak to their hearts, that they might lay aside whatever is in the way and give their life to you because you can do so much more with us than we ever could. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for those numbers. And the reason it's so important to put those numbers with those faces is because it tells the story. Every number represents a life being impacted for the kingdom. And so we just praise God together for all that he's doing. Let me just review a couple of things that maybe it went fast and you didn't quite catch it or haven't yet pondered it. 2,429 new connections as of last month and growing. That's the input into the system as it were. 2,429 people that we've made some connection with that we didn't know about, or had no connection to our church prior uh, to that. More and more and more connections. 471 new servants. That's people for the first time that we have record of saying, I want to I give away, give my time, be generous with my time and my efforts and my talents to serve to make an impact. Almost 3,000 total people serving. Now, some of those are double counted because we count serving roles, but that's okay. 3,000 people engaged in serving. 1,600 in groups with an average attendance of, of, of about almost 800. 214 people that are new givers. That's an important number to pay attention to. God moving in 214 people's heart to give financially to the mission here for the first time. And almost 200. By the way, I want, I want that to say 200. So who would like to be baptized today? Can we just get that done? I, I just, I'm sort of round number. Can we just get somebody? And it just feels like, come on, one person. Okay. That's a, that's a, a significant number as well. Steps of faith. 
On the other side of that, uh, 3,600 or plus, it was hard to count everybody's stadium service, um, but it was a remarkable turnout, even given the incredible heat. 5,100, 5, first time over 5,000 at Christmas in the history of our church, which is staggering. Uh, 6,100, and that includes Holy Week as well, people engaged at Easter and Holy Week. Now, it's not to pat ourselves on the back or to praise ourselves, just simply to say, you know, when we read this little thing, tr- troubling trends that churches are p- focused on security over succession, that's not been true of us. Or defense over offense, that's not been true of us. And I, that's God's grace and the movement of his spirit and the hearts of his people here, all of you. I want to celebrate that with you. But this tells me, these numbers that you saw in the video, on the paper, on the screen, tell a story of growth, of gospel growth and impact. And th- what I want to say to us as we look back and look forward in a moment is we have a responsibility to steward that kind of growth. We should not take that growth for granted. Doug will say it again in a few moments when he talks to us about the financial uh, health, but he-, he says it every year. He says it to us regularly on staff. These are not normal things if you look at the church in America today. God's doing, it should be, it grieves me that it's not normal, it should be, but we should be grateful and not take it for granted that this is happening, and then ask ourselves, what is our responsibility with that kind of growth? How do you steward growth? Here's what we don't do. Stewardship of gospel growth does not mean just try to protect what we have, just try to hold on to what we have. Play defense, in other words. That's not good stewardship. It requires wisdom, thoughtfulness, prayer, Faith, it also is going to require a measure of sacrifice and investment for future gospel growth. That's what it means to do. Think of Jesus' parable of the, of the talents. You all know this parable, right? Which of the master's servants does he say, well done, good and faithful servant, to? There was three of them, and only one he didn't say that to. The one who played defense. The one who buried it the one who just tried to protect what he had. Those that invested and grew, he said, well done. You've been responsible with a a few things. I'm going to give you many. So I think that's a word for us as a church. God's blessing. He's moving. Praise him. Let's steward it well, which means investing for future growth Um, and and future gospel impact, a willingness to do that. And it means a measure of risk-taking, trusting him in in the process. Speaking of kingdom investments and kingdom impact, that's where we're, we're, you're seated in one. It wasn't that long ago we were, we were talking about at breakfast, is this even feasible? Is this even possible? Is this desirable? Should we merge? Should we do this thing? It was way outside of our comfort zone or our experience. And, and I was here this morning worshiping this last hour. Look what God is doing. We're sitting in a tangible representation, not just bricks and mortar and steel, but the people and the impact happening here of kingdom impact, of future gospel growth. We want to praise God for that. In fact, I'd like Pastor Sterling to come up now, if he would. Where is he? Oh, right in front of me. (laughs) And uh, just give us a a couple of, uh, so let's welcome up here, give a few words of of what God's doing here at Mill Creek. Well, thank you. It is good just to take a moment. Um, It's a, a privilege to be able to share a little bit of the story of the Mill Creek campus. And it was just um, just a little less than 24 months ago when we held our first public service in this space. Um, at that point in time, in 2017, there was about uh, 150 of us that had gathered together and trained and prepared and, and met and Um, came out to be a launch team from the South Street and the Worship Cafe and Kesslinger campuses to launch this campus. Um, Over those last 24 months, we have seen God work and his faithfulness and move in not only the life of the church and the launch team, but those who have been added to our numbers. In the last quarterly report, um, just again, just for some context, um, our average worship attendance. So in, in 2017, we started with one service at 10 a.m. By the time of that January of 2018, um, we felt it was already necessary to go to two services. Um, as of the last quarter, our average worship attendance um, on a Sunday morning, in this, so sitting in this room, was 326 people. Um, if you count the kids hanging out down the hall, which we do, 
Um, the average jumps up to 425 people. When we add our now uh, Saturday night service that has transitioned over to this campus, it's up to 557 people on average in a weekend um, here at this campus. And so I, I say all of that is just, again, a celebration of God's faithfulness, his activity and his work, um, how he is growing and, and, and the ways that he is moving in the life of the congregation. And some of the best stories are from the, the members, the launch team that came out here and some of their family and friends who are now connected and have a place of, of belonging and growth and faith community and are growing in their journey with Jesus. Um, over the course of these last 22, 23 months, we have seen 522 brand new connections. So that was somebody that came for the very first time that we've never had on our registers before. Never came to a women's event or a children's activity or anything. Brand new to Chapel Street Church. That represents over 202 brand new families. Um, last year at our Christmas Eve service, we had 814 people in attendance in our Christmas Eve service and over 650 on Easter weekend, where we celebrated for the very first time at, um, at Chapel Street Church Mill Creek, a baptism service, um, where we had 24 individuals um, identify in, with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism, um, two of which happened to be my daughters. Um, <laughs> It was an amazing morning, an amazing morning of celebrating, but um, not only the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also these individuals and their stories and mm -hmm. saying to this church community, I, I want to identify publicly with him. Um, at this point in time, and Doug, you might speak more to this, but um, the Mill Creek campus and the weekend weekly offerings is now a um, self-sustaining campus, meaning that the growth that has happened here has got us to the point where the budget needs for this campus is met by the community that, that attends this campus, which is was what the very outset, one of our goals and objectives that we had identified was within two years we wanted to be um, at that place financially. All of this is Great, and it's encouraging. And again, I can't overstate uh, the degree to which we have seen God working and moving. And, and the numbers are helpful, and they help us wrap our heads around that. And yet for me, I think one of the things that I look for, that I listen to, are the stories. Um, and, and there are a number of those, but just briefly, I, I want to share two. One is of a couple that was invited. So when we opened this campus, um, we, we threw a big block party, we called it, open house, out in the parking lot with food trucks and games and activities. And um, we had so many of our neighbors and friends come and one couple came for the very first time to Chapel Street to that block party. Um, they were invited back by the friends that, that had invited them to the party. Um, and, and the husband at the time, he hates me telling this story, but um, he said, I'll give you one week. Um, they hardly ever miss a week now. In fact, um, um, Jim and Cindy um, were baptized on Easter Sunday morning. Um, they, they, they met Jesus at Chapel Street Church, Mill Creek. They got plugged into serving almost instantly. Um, they've got involved in a small group. They um, identified publicly their faith in Jesus with this community on Easter Sunday morning. It was just, when you think of a picture of what you hope for when you're doing something like this, that's one couple whose story just sort of captures that for me. Mm -hmm. The second story is, is a more recent story, and it's the story of of a young mom who, uh, again, with the block party, they, her and her husband and their kids were moving into this community from out of state. They happened to be house hunting on the same weekend that we were hosting the block party and drove, they didn't attend the block party, they only drove by and saw the commotion. And when they drove by, she remembers saying to herself, that's the kind of church I'd like to go to. Um, now that they've moved into the area, she is attending regularly. Um, but beyond that, she's found a place of connection. Um, as you, many of you know, when you move into a new community and you know no one, and you're looking for friends and you're looking for a place of belonging and you're trying to figure out life and you're wondering where that's gonna come from. She recently sent some of us an email on staff and talked about her experience at the Mill Creek campus. 
And she says that this has been a, a, a lifeline for me and my family, a place of connection and belonging, a place to call home. Mm. Um, and I'm so thankful because much of that story has nothing to do with me. It's just the people of God living in community together and reaching out to people. And we continue to see more and more of those stories unfolding here and at all of our campuses. Um, lastly, I'll just add that recently in a staff meeting, Pastor Jeff asked us, he said, where do you, what do you dream about for five years from now? Like, what, what is it that stirs in your heart when you think about what God is going to do and lead? And I remember when we were setting goals for this campus before we opened, I was thinking and praying about what God would do in this community. And one of the things that it was impressed on my heart that would be for me a, a, a indicator of, of this entire vision of being a neighborhood church was a day when this, from this campus, God would launch another campus. Meaning when, if you think of it as the kids having kids, right? Like when the, that third generation of, of, of church. And I remember praying about this and thinking, okay, um, 10 years. And it was like, 10 years is too long. And then I thought, okay, five years. And he's like, that's, that's too soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I just remember, I, I wrote this down, and um, that at seven years was, was the point where I just prayed, Lord, okay, within seven years, send from this place that you sent from those campuses um, to, to be in a new neighborhood with a new community of people who are living out the same vision of of transforming lives and, and impacting people with the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. That's it's about five years from now. Um, so we pray towards that end. And, and, and that, with that, I wanna just thank you because I, I, every time I walk through the halls of South Street or I'm preaching at Kessling or any time I run into you all anywhere, I constantly hear the refrain, hey, we're praying for you. We're praying for you out at the Mill Creek campus. We're excited to hear what God is doing. Um, so thank you. Thank you. If the kids have kids, that makes, will make me a grandfather, and then Brian will be the great-grandfather. <laughs> and you're right, five years old is too soon for the kids to have kids. <laughs> hey, just a moment, just for a moment. Um, would all the Mill Creek staff members, if you're here, stand up? We want to recognize you and say thank you. Good, awesome. Praise God for you. Thank you. Now, now... Would all those who are here that were part of uh, First Baptist Batavia and then Faith Baptist Mill Creek and now part of Chapel Street Church Mill Creek, would you stand up? We're grateful for you and want to praise God for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, there's so many more things we could talk about with that, but I just love hearing those stories. I know, is, is Jim, are Jim and Cindy here? Uh, they're out of town. They're out of town. Yeah, he knew you'd tell the story. Yeah. yeah. From one week to baptized, I love that, yeah. Um, the, the growth that we've experienced, not just here at Mill Creek, but in our church as a whole, has not without its challenges. I was listening to a leadership podcast last week, it said all growth uh, brings complexity, and complexity eventually kills growth unless you fight against it. So some of our challenges has been, has been dealing with that growth, uh, and, and mu much of that challenge um, has been internal how we're structured, what our organization looks like and how it operates. That's been, we've had some growing pains and some things to figure out there. We've been asking ourselves the question, I've been asking this question, are we organized and structured well, not just for who we are right now, but for where we believe God is taking us, for future growth, for effective, efficient leadership and future gospel growth. And so we've been making some changes, some staff transitions, which are some of them are just normal, natural part of the, the life of any church and some staff additions. And so you'll see here on the screen an image of a, an organizational diagram. Uh, the larger circles are not because they're more important or because they're heavier but because that's just the roles in which we organize around those three people. We call that a, a senior leadership team. We have, many of you know this, we have not had an executive pastor of ministries. Up until recently, 
until tomorrow, actually, I have uh, nine direct reports, which is too many. I'm not a good manager of nine individual department heads, and it takes me away from what I'm naturally good at, and, where, and it's not going to get us where God is taking us, and so we've made some changes. You already know this. You've been welcoming, but I want to just recognize publicly that executive direct pastor of ministries is John Bechtel. John's here with his wife, Layla, and two of his daughters. Would you stand up, John, so we can see and praise? And oh, your whole family. Yay. Come on, stand up. Yeah. You can have a chance to chat with John uh, later today and certainly in, in, in the years to come. But that's John's role. You see the departments that will be reporting into him, and this is just a high-level representation. There's obviously more complexity to all the different reporting structures that are on there. And the other one, Executive Director of Operations, that's Doug's current role. Um, and our staff knows this, but some of you that are here might not know this. Doug has had enough of this role. No, just kidding. <laughs> Doug has served us so faithfully and well for six years, six, six, isn't it? Six and change, starting your seventh, I believe. Uh, and, and I remember when Eric Harris was in this role and, it was, and really built this department. Is Eric here? Is there, yes. And we, when Eric decided it was time for him to, well, Barb decided it was time for Eric to stop doing this role. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, wow, who are we going to find to replace Eric? He was so dear and, and so excellent in the role. And, and uh, not that Doug has caused us to forget about Eric, but he stepped in, was perfect, God's man for that role at that time. And now Doug is, you know, he's got grandkids popping out left and right, and he's, 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 he's going to transition to a new stage of life. And we were praying the same thing. And God has again answered that prayer. And we have already uh, made the offer, and it's been accepted, although he, he won't start until uh, probably the uh, beginning of October, um, is our new executive director of operations, Abe Doncel. Abe is also here. Would you stand up, Abe and Heidi? Yay. <laughs> Awesome. Abe, many of you will know, Abe was part of our, Abe and Heidi and their family part of our church for over a decade, uh, and then we were talking about Abe serving on the executive council, potentially. I was talking and dreaming about maybe hiring him when he was done, you know, making the big money. Uh, and, uh, and then, but God called them, they moved to California, and then some things happened. You can hear the story another time, and, uh, and organized it and orchestrated his life to come back and serve in this role, and I think it's the perfect fit, and I'm just so thrilled to be able to talk about that with you, answers to prayer literally here with us. Um, it, it's really, on Thursday this week, I was on an emergency conference call with a pastor that I'm in a cohort with. Uh, they're around the nation, church pastors that are uh, leading churches that are fairly large and similar complexity to ours, and it, 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 it all centered around some real dysfunction and crisis on this guy's staff. And I knew this before that conference call, but I was profoundly grateful for the kind of staff that we have. The privilege it is for me to lead and serve with such competent, passionate, high character, godly men and women. So if you're here at Chapel Street Church staff members, do you stand up, please? We just want to praise God for you and say thank you for you, all staff members. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, we love you, and are very grateful for you. Okay, let's look ahead now briefly before we turn it over to Doug, he'll take forever. No, only kidding. <laughs> uh, I want to look ahead uh, briefly and talk in these terms in three categories about what it means to steward the gospel growth we're experiencing well. There are so many things at church that we could be doing. In fact, one of the unique challenges of my role is it's, there's endless opportunities, things we could do. So part of my job, I think, is to think and pray and help us focus in on what we should be doing to be faithful to the mission and vision God has given us. Because what we could do is endless. And I want to talk about those in three broad categories. First category, increasing our impact. We must continue to increase our impact in our community, neighborhood, community, and around the world. At the top of this list, I think, is a ministry called Shepherd's Heart. You've heard about it. We talk about it all the time. I hope you didn't miss 10,000 plus people served in Shepherd Heart this year. Every time we've made an investment in Shepherd's Heart with leadership or in space, it has grown and exceeded that capacity every time, and it's doing it again. And I think we need to pay attention to what God is doing and sort of get on board with it. This will mean some significant changes to our South Street facilities in the future and how we organize where we put Shepherd's Heart and how we uh, structure it for growth. It'll mean some staffing changes and ad additions. It'll mean some uh, changes to how that's organized because it's just beginning, I think, to become what it could be. And we're seeing God bless it in so many ways. Aaron, if Aaron Wise is in the back there with her husband, John. Ask her about her new puppy. But then after that, ask her, ask her also about 
um, these, these quiet time bags they're handing out to our Shepherd's Heart clients and the stories that are coming out of that. I could go on and on about that, but we need to pay attention to that and make investments in that for the sake of the kingdom and future gospel growth. Second, serve the world initiatives. This year has been a very unique year. Pastor Bruce is here somewhere. Right in front, sorry. Uh, and really I tell Bruce, keep giving me the exciting projects because it's difficult for all of you to pay attention to 12 partners, six partners, eight partners that we have. Bruce does this and his team does this and they manage those relationships beautifully. But as a church family, we can really only pay attention to one or two. So we want to highlight one or two unique partners and projects to be the face of Serve the World for that particular season. We've done this with Life Water Digging Wells. We've done this with Hope for Life in Rwanda, building a facility which is already underway, and Pastor Brian was just there, can tell you about it. We've done this in, in, with the Bible Translation and the uh, Seed Company and pro Project, and we're going to continue to do that. Bring to our church family unique opportunities with Serve the World Partners, which are just a taste of all the unite, exciting things God is doing uh, through Serve the World. And, so, and then the, the third is local serving opportunities. We've been talking about Neighborhood Serve. If you're here at the annual meeting, which presumably means you're part of the core, you care deeply about what's going on here, otherwise why would you come to a meeting like this? You, you go out and to brunch or whatever, but I mean, you're here. So I, I presume all of you have signed up for Neighborhood Serve. If you haven't, I hope it's because you're out of town or you plan to be like in, in, in you know, Zimbabwe or something on that day. Because this is, if you, sign up, sign up to serve. This is just one opportunity of the ongoing many opportunities we wanna continue to explore and find to be good neighbors through service. To be the kind of church that our neighbors are grateful that we exist, whether or not they ever come to us, attend here. That they're glad Chapel Street Church. I want people to be saying, I don't know if I believe what they believe, but I'm so glad they're doing what they're doing. I'm so glad that place is here, because they're making a difference. So that's when I think about increasing our impact. And then second, expanding our reach. Expanding our reach. This means multiplying. Many of the exciting things that are on the screens and on the paper we've been talking about and the stories being told are because we've made investments, particularly at speaking about this campus at, at Mill Creek. And when we talked about becoming a family of neighborhood churches, committed to transforming lives, right, and seeing the gospel grow, that was not going to stop with one. We're really two and a half campuses because South Street and Kesslinger are like a mile long hallway between them. Pastor Kenton said, used that phrase when he first got here. I think he's right. There's, a, there's I, I believe with all my heart, and we are planning and preparing and moving toward it. The executive council is all on board. This was the focus of our retreat last in May, is a fourth campus. Now, we don't know where that is. We don't have one a building yet, but we're doing all we can financially and in leadership development to be ready when that opportunity comes so that we can respond when the Spirit of God gives us an opportunity. In fact, part of what I've asked Pastor Bruce to do is actively begin looking and praying. So we, I wanna invite you as your lead pastor to join us in prayer that we're financially ready, we're ready as a leadership team, and that God will bring to us the right opportunity to expand our reach so we can see more lives, more stories like Jim and Cindy, more people impacted, more neighborhoods reached for the sake of the gospel. It's not a secret that large churches are getting a bad rap around the nation, particularly in Chicagoland area. It's not time to play defense. Be afraid of what... It's time to steward this gospel growth well because their needs are huge. One of the lies I think we believe in the suburbs is everybody's fine. They're fine. They're not fine, friends. They're not fine. They need Jesus. They need the church. Okay. Um, and third, deepening our hearts. Remember I talked about those five troubling trends. One is, is growth over health. It'd be also be unhealthy to focus on health over growth because they, they aren't diametrically opposed. They go together. But as we continue to increase our impact and expand our reach, we need to pay attention to our growing our hearts and growing disciples. And at the tip of the spear in that initiative is something called Rooted. You've heard a little bit about this. Some of you just heard maybe a video about this. Our executive council has been through it. Our staff has been through it. We will be rolling it out slowly in stages to our whole church family. It's not a one-time program. We do it once upon a time. We want to make it become slowly part of the DNA, the lifeblood of our church, the on-ramp into the life of Christ in Chapel Street Church. It's a 10-week discipleship program. It asks a lot of people. But that's kind of the point. Jesus doesn't say, hey, listen, uh, fit me in the margins <laughs> when you have time. It's a whole life surrender. And so you're going to be hearing more about this. It's going to be rolled out. There's a, with about, we have 75 or so people, Laura, is that right? About 70 or so that are be launching in kind of a pilot for our, not a pilot, but a, the first rollout for our 
church family, and then another wave in this new year, and then again in the fall, and it'll keep coming. So I want you to begin to pray and, mar- and look for those opportunities and when, you, when the time is right for you to step in. And then last on this list, but not least, is generosity. And, but when I say generosity, I mean in all of its forms, not just increase our giving. Good things are happening there. Doug will talk about that in a moment. I mean to continue to teach from God's word about what it means to live with a a generous life, a generous heart, with our mind, our words, our speech. In fact, next sermon, next week in Disciplines of Grace is going to be on being generous with our words, the discipline of blessing, to teach generosity in all of its forms with our lives. Remember, years ago, Pastor Brian, we preached a sermon called Generosity is Freedom from Smallness of Heart. I I, I love that phrase. And to continue to, to teach, preach, and motivate people to be generous, not least of which is with their resources. Because there's no limit to what God can do if we're going to be, if we'll, if we'll be all in and fully surrender to what he wants to do in us and through us. And so, again, we could talk more details there and I'll certainly be t- maybe some questions that arise as you have them, but I just wanted to give you a brief look back to celebrate, a look at what's happening right now, and then I look forward to where I think in these three areas, in increasing our impact, expanding our reach, and deepening our hearts as a church family as we move forward to steward well the growth we're already experiencing. Okay? Who's next? Doug. Doug Kite, come on down. In the uh, slightly over two hours they've given me, (laughs) you don't think I could do that. Yeah, you believe. I, as I have stood before you for now my seventh year, and thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to serve you in this role. It's been one of the thrills of my life. Um, I have two objectives. One, I want to give you a framework by which you can assess the church's financial health. And I have, as I did last year, five questions that I think are relevant. You could be up here for a long time talking about church finances, but I want to try to do this in five questions. Number one, how are we doing in terms of revenue, generosity, up, down, flat? 75% of the churches in North America are declining in attendance and giving. That's the context in which we sit in 2019 in in the United States. And I think, as Jeff said, it's really important to understand what God is doing through Chapel Street Church. How is your staff stewarding the resources that you have generously given toward the ministry here? Number three, what is the net worth of our church? The balance sheet? This is uh, one of the number one documents uh, that accountants look at when they assess the health of any organization. Number four, and this ties right into what Jeff was talking about and Sterling so beautifully, are we outwardly focused? We know that the healthiest churches in in the United States are fighting the enemy outside and not having battles within. Does that make sense? They're focused outside and taking the gospel into the corners of their neighborhoods. And number five, are we following best practices in the area of financial controls? Are we giving you reasons to have confidence when you put that money in the plate on Sunday or through the online platforms, should you have confidence in us? So those are, that's the framework I want to give you. The second thing I I want to do is I'm going to review the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, and I am going to encourage you to approve it. So with that, please know that the church's financial health is not determinative of our spiritual condition, but it's an outward indicator. I like what Larry Burkett used to say. Our generosity as individuals is simply an outward indicator of an inward spiritual condition. So in that context, let's move through what I have for you today. Here's our total revenue. Now, when I say total revenue, I'm including the general fund in the navy blue bar, 
giving to our benevolence ministry, including Shepherd's Heart in the green, and to serve the world in the yellow. And you can see the trend there year over year. That's a four-year growth from 2015 to 2019 of 30 percent. There are very few churches in America that could show a chart like this. Up 14 percent just in the last year, up 6 percent between 17 and 18, and 6 percent between 16 and 17. God is at work. And you know what thrills me is not the numbers, although as the leader of, of finance here, I love the numbers. <laughs> but that isn't what's exciting. What's exciting is it's the evidence of the Holy Spirit moving in the hearts of his people. An understanding that generosity is not the means to the end, it is the mission. As Jeff just said, in all its forms. That's the mission. And this is so exciting, what impact we can have and are having when, when we have this kind of, when these kinds of numbers. We have, had, we have enjoyed here at Chapel Street Church 10 straight years of general fund increase between 2010 and 2019 coming out of the recession. 68% growth over that decade. Stewardship, where that red dot is, if it's inside the navy blue bar, that means your staff is living within its means. We're spending less than the revenue, and I can tell you that in each of those years, we have spent less than budgeted. So that's just some data for you to assess that second point. I want to uh, take a little bit of a side journey here just to show you what's going on in our culture and how the world of portable online giving platforms has impacted Chapel Street Church. These are two pie charts, 2015 on the left, as you can see, 2019 on the right. The green represents the percentage of general fund revenue that comes in through an online portal, either uh, uh, a laptop or a desktop, but also through the app. So you can see in just these four years, it's nearly tripled. So this is what's happening. As we know, our whole lives are contained in those little devices we call iPhones. <laughs> And, um, and so we have to keep up with where the culture's taking us. 81% of Americans have a smartphone. 98% of millennials, those aged 18 to 34, have a smartphone. Take your kids out to dinner and ask them to pay for it. They won't have cash, <laughs> regrettably. They don't know what a checkbook is. <laughs> and so here we are. We're here. And I, I want that number to go up uh, for the principal reason that it provides a predictable, consistent cash flow. Any organization thrives on that. Those of you who have run businesses, you know that. And the generosity here in continues each week, no matter where you are. And that's a beautiful thing for those of us making decisions on a weekly basis. So uh, this is a good thing. If you are giving by check, we love you. <laughs> that's okay. No problem. We love you. But uh, if you, uh, uh, you want to use the online portals, that's great too. So. That was, I thought, an interesting piece of data. Did you know that, uh, as I was researching, uh, that we, uh, the um, uh, average American checks his phone every 10 minutes? I know that's true for me. Can you imagine what would happen if the people of God dropped in prayer every 10 minutes instead of checked their phone? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just something to think about. Uh, more on stewardship. This year, as of July 31, you approved last year a budget of 4.45 million. You can see there the, uh, this is again at, through 11 months, 
of the fiscal year, ends on August 31. Revenue was up almost 6% over budget. Expenses were uh, inside of budget by a little over 2%. And you can see by department there, uh, John Hookengood runs our care ministries. The equipping ministries are a compendium of the lead pastor, Jeff, uh, Brian Coffey, our pastor of leadership and development, Lorene Coffey, who leads our women's ministries, Laura Taro, who leads our groups, and now, in this year's budget, the executive pastor, John Bechtel, who will lead uh, those, uh, many of those ministries. So that's a compendium of, of a lot of different ministries. Of our, our facilities, uh, James Chavez is our manager of facilities. He's part of my team. And that includes mortgage payments that we have for uh, uh, the leftover debt from Growing to Serve back in 2014. And, and now from the Neighborhood Impact Campaign, we pay the mortgage interest uh, through James's budget. Uh, Sterling, of course, at Mill Creek, and they are doing a great job being self-sustaining. Uh, I, can, I can affirm that. He also includes the, the mortgage uh, that we inherited when we merged with Faith Baptist. Uh, so that's a part of Sterling's budget as well. Missions and serving. Uh, Pastor Bruce, as, uh, as was discussed, that includes uh, benevolence, local serving, support to, what is it, Bruce, about 39 missionaries across the world that we support. Uh, many mission organizations, Shepherd's Heart, short-term teams led by uh, Shana Duncan. Uh, that is not serve the world. This is separate from serve the world. This is inside the general fund budget. The operations, that is uh, my team. Uh, and then we, all the infrastructure is there uh, for the church from uh, IT to uh, facilities payroll to the benefits for the whole staff, our insurance, uh, our administration, payroll taxes, and all of that. And uh, I am, again, the only one over budget. Um, but I have a whole host of very compelling excuses. <laughs> but when you boil them all down, you can get it into seven words. The ministry leaders made me do it. <laughs> Student and kids, of course. Pastor Chris Saros with her team, uh, Becky Chenault, Jamie Valentini, Nancy Dieter. Our student leaders, Tom Ward and Gretchen Gilbert, and Andrew Griffiths. So they run a lot of ministries through, through their department. And then Kenton Cobra, our pastor of worship, and he also has technology. So Eric Robertson is a part of that. So that's the data I have to answer the first two questions. Is our generosity growing? That's a sign of health. And are we practicing good stewardship? You can draw your own conclusions there. Number three, how's our financial strength as measured by our balance sheet? We have a net worth of over $18 million. That's up about 3% from last year. That consists pretty simply of a couple key assets, cash and some uh, conservative investments. Of that cash, about $581,000 is unrestricted, meaning uh, it isn't tied or designated to any particular ministry. It's there for the operations of the church. It's about one and a half months of expenses. So think of it as your individual savings accounts. It's there if you need it for major expenses. I like to have at least one, if not two months there. This is about, again, about 1.6. Um, I feel good about that. Um, but it can always be more. Um, 398,000 of that is designated, meaning it could be set aside for serve the world for benevolence or some of our other designated funds. Those fixed assets there are our buildings. Uh, those are entered at cost, less depreciation, so we have a uh, little bit over $20 million in facilities and uh, equipment. So the total assets there of $21.75 million. Current liabilities, those are our accounts payable currently, and we'll, we'll pay those off in due course. 
Uh, Long-term liabilities consist of uh, basically two mortgages. One, uh, what was left over from growing to serve, about 355000 from the Mill Creek uh, mortgage that we inherited in 2016. That's about now 468000 So that's one mortgage at 3.25%. So it's at a very good interest rate, and we pay that all through the general fund budget. The other is uh, neighborhood impact. Uh, our current capital campaign, it is, uh, we ha currently have uh, a mortgage of 2.28 million. That is down $1 million from a year ago when I stood before you. So we have consistently chipped away at that. That is at 3.75%. Uh, we got these at very favorable rates. Today, prime rate is five and a quarter. So uh, these are very, very favorable rates for us, and we anticipate uh, eliminating those as quickly as we can, but uh, certainly within the next several years. So that is the net worth of the church. So the financial strength of the church is $18 million. Okay, question four, are we externally focused? Jeff went through this. Here are some, number, some more numbers to put to it. Uh, these are dollars that have been spent this fiscal year in these various areas. So taking them from the upper left, benevolence, that's the, this is, these are the funds that are provided for Erin and her team to, to give to those in our community with acute financial needs. And Erin has people in our uh, South Street campus uh, nearly every day who are there to apply for funds. Uh, they may have, uh, I sign checks every day uh, where somebody's utilities are about to be shut off. But they have to prove themselves. You just don't come in and ask. Aaron vets them very, very carefully, very wisely. Um, and so uh, it could be uh, missing a mortgage payment or a car payment, uh, that kind of thing. So th this is really uh, uh, quite impactful. Um, and, and we're known as a place to come in our community. And they come from all over our region because they've heard. They get sent to us by other ministries, right, Aaron? So Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, they send them to Chapel Street Church because they know we will help when they can't for whatever reason. That's how we're known. That's, that's our reputation. Missionary support, I've mentioned uh, Bruce has relationships with 38 or 39 missionaries out on the field all over the world. He's got uh, three couples in the queue, very exciting. We could be adding some more this uh, fiscal year for people going out feeling God's call to take the gospel to various parts of the, of the world. Mission trips, uh, where we give opportunities for our students and adults to go out and impact uh, in, in this disciple, discipleship making uh, part of our, our uh, church. Uh, our local serving, uh, Jeff talked about neighborhood serve. That's all being done, organized through uh, our local serving organization. And then serve the world. Dozens of partners around the world are beneficiaries of the generosity of Chapel Street Church. And he highlighted two of them, Amanda Good. Remember Amanda, Hope for Life in Rwanda. Uh, impacting street kids in Rwanda with the gospel. And then we have Ed and Jan Katinsky in our adopt verse Remember when we signed up for verses on the wall and we're putting God's word into the hands of indigenous people in Indonesia? I mean, very diverse, but how impactful is that? That's exciting. Gospel impact, street kids on the one hand, getting God's word into the hands of people on the other, and there's a whole host of other things that we're doing through Serve the World. This should get you up in the morning. It does. Yes. <laughs> so $1.267 million went outside our walls. 12% increase over 2018. 22.6% of our total giving on that chart I showed you earlier. Very few churches could show this chart. And I'm, again, like Jeff, I'm not patting ourselves on the back. I'm simply pointing out what God is doing. Because it's, we, we don't always see the big picture, and it, it's very, very exciting. 
So here's our trend in terms of gospel impact beyond over the last five years. You can see it. The last four, a million dollars or more has gone out. We have always been an externally focused church, and, and that, that is so gratifying. Uh, this is just who we are as people here, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ uh, at Chapel Street Church. Okay, so that's question number four. Are we externally focused. And lastly, uh, should you have confidence in how we handle your resources? I'm not going to go through all of our financial controls. I want you to know that we have one of the finest accounting firms audit these every single year. Cape and Kraus, national accounting firm, probably the top church accounting firm in the country. And they come in and spend three days scouring through our practices. Fred Morris, Britta Ness, uh, these people are first rate at what they do. And they've got these processes and tools in uh, beautiful shape. Uh, they, uh, the auditors can never find a single deficiency. These are the best practices that are not followed in all the churches, if you've read any of the stories, sadly, of our churches in our own region. So we don't take these for granted every day. I walk by Fred's desk and I see sweat beating off his forehead. <laughs> and I say, Fred, did you just work out? And he says, no, I'm thinking about the controls, Doug. <laughs> I say, well, then continue on. But uh, no, th th these are, th you do sweat over these, don't you, Fred? But it's so important and, he, and, and because you have to have confidence in, in the, the handling of, of God's resources that you've generously provided. So we want to give you, the, 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 the finance team wants to give you the AAA treatment. Accountability, we want to hold ourselves to the highest standards. Accuracy, to the penny. And adherence to the rules whether those are national accounting rules that we follow, to the rules of the Internal Revenue Service as a nonprofit tax-exempt organization, or moral and ethical rules from God's word, we want to give you the AAA treatment. So that's the fifth and final question to ask yourself about how is Chapel Street Church doing financially? So what do you think? Is that helpful? Okay, with that, we're going to go to objective number two. We're going to talk about the general fund budget. Hopefully you've seen this. We've published materials both online and in print for the last three weeks or so. This is a budget that was developed by the department leaders I identified earlier. So these are the people responsible directly for their ministries or their organizations. They do a back and forth with the senior leaders for about two and a half months. We then sit down with the executive council, your elected leaders, and we go back and forth. And then finally, we approve a final budget that we present to you, the members, with a recommendation to approve it. And that's what I'm here to provide today. So let's just break it down. These are a lot of numbers, and I don't mean to overwhelm you with data. But I just want you to see trend more than anything. I think it's important to understand context here. And you can see that from 2016, uh, we have continually grown. Why? The neighborhood vision, the opening of Mill Creek, our attendance is up about 7% year over year. Again, very few churches can say that. Our programming, we prudently added staff as our programming has increased, as our facilities have increased. We are now at 60 employees. A year ago when I stood before you, we were at 57. 21 full-time, 39 part-time. Um, and so when you break all that down, uh, we have uh, this year in the budget 45 full-time equivalents, that's what FTE stands for. When you convert the part-time to full-time, it, it, it takes us to 45. Um, 
We are adding positions, as Jeff indicated, to position ourselves for continued growth. We're trying to be uh, responsive to what God is doing here. And we see campuses four coming and maybe beyond. Sterling's dream, five years. Um, it may be sooner than that. And so we want to be ready because an organization cannot grow any faster than its infrastructure allows. We're the governor on it, so we've got to uh, be prepared to support the organization as it grows. Now, this jump from 4.45 to 5 is larger than in the past. It is. But when we look at what is actually happening here, when we look at the generosity, uh, that jump from what we anticipate actual giving will be this year to five million is about seven and a half percent, which is pretty consistent with our growth over the past three years. I don't think it's not uh, an outlandish jump at all. Our nine-year average is about six percent. So it's right in there, 7.5%. Built into it are some levers, some margin, where we can pull if we need to should things not work the way we think they, they will. So there are some safety valves in this. I want you to uh, be assured of that. So with that, I will take you through, hopefully fairly swiftly, and some of these, uh, I want to just say right up front, and it, it's uh, based on what Jeff said, that we have done some internal restructuring. So some of these numbers, like when you see care ministries drop from 83 to 65, and you wonder what's going on. That's simply a movement of personnel from one budget category or one department to another. No change in the ministry. John has all the resources he needs to carry out his ministry. That's his number but we've done some internal restructuring. So you're gonna see that along the way here. So here's the budget. That's John's budget, the 65, the equipping ministries, uh, the leaders that I mentioned earlier. Um, that increase from 691 to 855 is due to some, uh, we've created the position of executive pastor. Uh, we've added a, uh, an executive assistant for him, Sue Ann Egan is gonna support uh, John Bechtel, um, and, and so there's been some shuffling there. Uh, we're adding a connections coordinator that will be uh, a person in charge of, of assimilation of people, all those 2,994 connections that were made that we talked about. Uh, we, we're going to have uh, uh, a new part-time position where that person will be responsible for taking our processes forward in and improving them so that we can do that well as as more and more people come through our doors the facilities budget decreased only because we moved some budget categories for office equipment and hospitality from there to my budget when we've created a new uh, administrative we've cored up or centralized our administrative staff so again these this is this is uh, what's needed to keep our facilities in good condition. Mill Creek, uh, there's Sterling's budget. Uh, he's adding a new part-time administrative role. As he's grown out here, as he described, over 500 people coming in on an average week. Uh, he's got some administrative needs that need to be met. So we've added that to his budget. Bruce's budget has gone up a little bit. There's always some puts and takes every year on the mission field, right, Bruce? Some people come off, we add new people on, so He's got a, a funding process for taking care of our, our missionaries and mission organizations. My operations budget, uh, it looks like I've created a kingdom, <laughs> but really, on my way out. <laughs> bad timing, bad timing. But what we've done here is we've centralized our administrative team. Now this is part of of building an infrastructure that can take you into the future. So we've got some uh, key processes that we need to align and improve. We have um, 
uh, best practices that we're not following that we can follow. We're, we've got to get a new church management system. We're living with a 20-year-old legacy software system that's managing the operations of the church, and we've got to get that updated soon. And so we just see a real opportunity here with the administration team of our church uh, under a manager, Jennifer Gomel, who will take it to the next level and and prepare us for campuses four and five and beyond. So there's just some real opportunity here. I'm excited about that. And she's taking on hospitality, office equipment, those kinds of things. Uh, we've also got in there some increases in benefit costs. Uh, healthcare goes up every year, as you know, and we're doing uh, as well as we can, actually a pretty good job of, of controlling that. But there are some increases built into the budget. Student kids ministries, there's some, again, those are uh, offsets um, uh, with some of the administrators being transferred into operations uh, there, um, and uh, worship going up uh, a little bit uh, with a, uh, uh, a new role, uh, tech assistant for Eric Robertson, who's really running production by himself, and so we need an, an assistant there. Importantly here, you see next campus. The executive council made a recommendation to senior leadership that we want to be very intentional about being ready for the fourth campus. So we're going to, this budget includes uh, $50,000 uh, to set aside to be prepared, and that'll have to be built on over the coming years, to be prepared for a fourth campus, whatever that may look like. So that's an additional budget item, and then you see equally a $50,000 uh, reserve. So that is the budget. I have one more chart and then I'll open it up to questions. And that's where are we on our neighborhood impact campaign that ends next April. This is the campaign that gave us this church and we've been doing well. Uh, we've got total receipts of uh, about 4.2 million. The, the uh, total cost of the neighborhood impact construction, it impacted all three of our facilities was 6.2, uh, and that's the $2.2 million debt that I talked about earlier when you add in some interest. We've got a little under a million left on pledges, so if we are successful in uh, seeing those fruits, uh, we should exit the, the campaign next April at a at a, with a debt of about 1.5 million, again at 3.75 percent interest. So it's it's a very good investment. You think about what God has done here. If we had not taken that money out and invested it in in the kingdom impact here, uh, we would have not seen all the fruits that Jeff and Sterling describe. So we're in good shape there, um, and I think we'll get that debt paid off in due time. Okay, I'll open it up to questions on any or all of the above. And we've got microphones, Sterling has a mic. Jeff has a mic. Right over here, Steve. <clears throat> Yes, <clears throat> could you please explain exactly what the pastoral residency looks like? Pastoral residency? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Pastoral residency. So Jeff mentioned that leadership development, growing uh, the team from within, is a key strategic move to prepare yourself for growth. And so uh, through some very, very generous funding uh, from a Chapel Street family, uh, we were able to launch a pastoral residency program uh, under the leadership of Pastor Brian uh, that includes actually uh, three different organizations, Chapel Street Church, Judson University, and Bethel Seminary, our Converge Seminary. And we have formed a, a tripartite partnership aimed at identifying, educating, and sending out 
leaders. For us, we're looking for leaders of campuses. That's our current intent with this program, is to develop campus pastors so that we're ready for Campus 4 and Campus 5. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting thing. So we have one pastoral resident today. His name is Joe Scavato. He's standing in the very back. And we were blessed to get Joe. (laughs) Joe brings... Joe brings to our church years as a youth pastor in different churches. I know, I think his last church was in Indianapolis, if I'm not mistaken, Joe. And so you'll see more and more of him. He's working with Brian and Jeff and and Sterling and uh, getting trained up and getting opportunities. So we pay him a stipend. That's part of the generosity that this family established for us. Um, But it's it's basically a two-year program. Mm-hmm. And there's no promises at the end, but it's our hope that God is bringing us uh, these, these future leaders, and then we can use Judson and Bethel to help educate them, particularly through online tools. Is that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah? fair. Uh, Doug is expressing, and we just had a meeting just, just a week and a half ago, looking at what the future might look like. Um, Joe is currently in the residency program and has already received... Uh, postgraduate work, and so, he, or, so he's not going to Bethel. Uh, Andrew Griffiths, is Andrew here? Andrew's in the back there. Was a resident before the residency was the residency. Uh, and so we, it's, it's, it's growing. And what Doug's describing is what we envision the future to look like to your question, Steve, that we want to identify how can, how can the church and a place like Judson identify pastoral leaders, call them out, invest in them, and set them up so they don't have to put their life on hold or, or go into you know, extreme debt or live in the poorhouse to, and to be prepared and trained for, for pastoral ministry. Here, but our vision would be, obviously, that we're, we're, the, we're training the best and the brightest, but we're also launching people outside of here who may end up other places. So yeah, it's, it's a great question, and, I, and we're just beginning to see what that might become. Uh, last budget item for the fourth campus, 50,000, caught my eye. My question is about surpluses from other departments, surplus giving. Is there any chance that number could go up? Yes, yes, yes. Or do you have a, do you have a strategy for surpluses that might be different than that? Well, the first part of your question is we, we've, we've had internal conversations that we do want to, when we because we have seen surpluses each year, because for what Doug mentioned, we're both the generosity exceeding our target and the expenses being kept under our target. We'd love to make investments. We intend to make investments out of that surplus. There are always some capital things you want to do, improvements or purchases that we could do, but to, be, to limit those and invest in building a war chest so that we're financially ready. So the two parts of the readiness are paying down debt, which Doug talked about, and having enough cash on hand to either purchase, rent, or launch when the time comes. Does that answer your question, Clark? So yes, I anticipate that that's 50000 just designated at the outset, but to put a lot of the reserve, or the surplus, I should say, into that, uh, that category. I just appreciate our executive council saying, okay, if we're going to be serious about it, let's, let's put a line item. That's one way we can be intentionally saying we're doing this. We're praying and we're mo- moving forward. So. Others? This is your last shot at me. (laughs) At Doug. (laughs) And I should have said this earlier. Doug, we'll we'll have an appropriate time to celebrate Doug and make him feel awkward. Uh, But for now, you know. Any other questions? Thank you for your attentiveness. I hope I didn't keep you too long. All right, uh, so a couple of comments uh, based on, on Doug's presentation. First off, I have been in a number of business meetings uh, where they've had financial reports. Um, I can't remember one where in the middle you want to like shout out the amen. Uh, but, um, and just so you know, Doug said you know, he's, his time here in this role is short. His next official role at Chapel Street is campus pastor of our Sandwich, Illinois uh, <laughs> campus. So um, we'll be looking. I'm kidding, by the way. Somebody later is going to go, what, sandwich? No, just kidding. Maybe. Don't know. Maybe. Um, but uh, we, we very much appreciate uh, Doug 
You know, and uh, you, we joke about it. Why, why do we take so long to have the financial presentation? Uh, we absolutely understand that that is a critical confidence factor for, for a church. Uh, so many things can go wrong there and, and have gone wrong. We've seen them in a number of cases. So we understand that the integrity with which we manage your generosity is incredibly important. And we've had a you know, tremendous legacy in Eric and now Doug uh, for managing that for the church. And, and I think it just it, uh, it gives us a foundation of confidence for so many things that God is allowing us to do. So no pressure, Abe. Um, <laughs> wait, you haven't started yet. No, it's easy. It's easy. Don't. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, so. All right. Okay, it's time for us to go through the voting section of our meeting. We have four items to vote on. The first one we'll do uh, just by show of hands or vocal, and that is uh, approval of the last year's meetings, the 2018-19 annual meeting. Those have been posted online for some time, so hopefully you've read through those several times, I'm sure. Um, uh, then we're going to vote on the EC nominations, the Executive Council nominations. We'll do that uh, by ballot along with the nominating committee and the proposed budget uh, that uh, Doug just walked through. So those are the official motions on the floor. I do want to ask one more time if there are any questions related to any of those motions. None at all? Okay. So the first one, approval of the 2018-2019 minutes from the annual meeting. Um, uh, we'll do, basically just do that by vote. All those in favor, if you'd say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. So those are approved officially. Now for the second part of that, it is the ballots. And hopefully, if you have not voted online, you received a ballot. And mine is in here somewhere. Um, did you take my ballot, hon? <laughs> she tells me what to do anyway, so that's not... Um... <laughs> so it looks like this. So hopefully, uh, when you came in, if you haven't voted online, here's your ballot. It looks like this. So at this time, if you would go ahead and complete your ballot and pass those to the center, please. And Mr. Salvati will pick those up for us. Are you serious? All right. Thank you for that. Um, this is that time when our nominating committee is very quickly and uh, accurately trying to count the votes to make sure that we can give a proper accounting on those motions. And we'll have uh, me up here basically trying to stretch the time for the next seven minutes. I do have a few comments that I do want to make. First off, Doug, some of us use other things than iPhones. So if you want to use an Android device to you know, connect with the church, that's awesome. <laughs> Clearly, that was an issue, and I wanted to get that solved <laughs> right away. Um, another one I do, I do want to address, though, and, and um, right before the meeting, I had a couple of uh, church members um, uh, connect with me. I don't want to say confront me, but it was, it was uh, you know, I have a couple things I want to answer right now before the meeting. Um, and actually, I want to say to those of you who, who come up and ask questions, that's wonderful. Thank you for doing that. That's exactly what we need and exactly what we want from the membership. You as members of the church, it's your role and it's your responsibility to care for this church. You, this is your church, and the reason why we have membership is to, this is a congregationally led church. It is certainly managed through a management team, but this is your church. And so it's incredibly important for you to ask those questions, to engage, to let us know what you think, um, but but uh, never want you to feel any kind of concern or hesitancy to stop me, talk to anyone on the executive council who you saw stop earlier, uh, obviously connect with any of our staff. That's what we want you to do. So thank you for that. Now, some of the questions that I got had a lot to do with questions about some of the things you heard today. We got a new executive pastor. I, I really don't understand how that happened, or, or we're changing this or that, or, or what, what's next with the four? How do we, how do we know these things? And we have a lot of communications to go out, and I think 
probably more communications now than we've ever had before. We have an amazing communication staff. Uh, you see that in the quality of the presentations and videos and things like that, which are, I think is just wonderful. But it still doesn't matter. For, for the 200 people we have in the room, if we asked you your favorite way to connect with the church, we'd have 50 different answers. Everyone connects in the way that they most connect, and that has to do in some cases, whether or not you're comfortable with an iPhone or some other device, uh, whatever, whatever it may be, obviously it, the challenge for us is getting all the right communications down that channel for you. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is we want to know how you want to connect with the church. Uh, but another avenue that uh, you'll hear about coming up uh, soon is we are going to have another church family meeting. And in that church family meeting, not unlike a gathering like this, we're just going to open it up. We'll obviously have some presentation material where, where Jeff will uh, convey somewhat of what he did today along with some additional detail. And then we just want it to be open. Ask questions. Tell us what's on your mind. Uh, what did you not hear the way we intended you to hear it so that we can provide clarification? Because if you're like me, and I don't, I don't want to put my wife on the spot here, but sometimes she tells me stuff I don't understand. Pretty sure it's my fault. So... Um, <laughs> It might just be the way that we're communicating is not getting the right vocabulary that, that helps you get the clarity that you need for what we're doing. So we're going to have a church family meeting, and we want to invite you to that, uh, to, to have that conversation. Make sure that we're, we're transparent with you, that you are getting the information you need uh, in terms of the happenings of the church. All incredibly exciting for me today, um, and, and I'm church chairman, you think I know everything I don't. I, I hear things that are new every time, and it always amazes when we talk about serving, especially local serving, how much we do just in our own community. And you heard Sterling give his vision for Chapel Street, Mill Creek. I've had a vision here for a long time, and it does have to do with serving. I've always had in my head this idea of the church being the center of the community, the idea that this community, the Fox Valley and surrounding area, when they think about our community, one of the things they think about is Chapel Street is the place we go when we need something. Chapel Street supports our communities. Chapel Street is everywhere in our community. That's what I love about the serving uh, day coming up next week when we're gonna be out in the community serving with t-shirts. Um, I have a relative down in Texas, they do something similar, and the greatest stories you hear about when they're out in the community after they've done their services wearing their, wearing their t-shirts and they see each other in the local restaurants and they connect here and it's like, oh, where did you serve, where do you serve? And people around hear that. It's just a fantastic celebration of people caring about their neighbors, caring about their community. So for those of you participating, thank you for participating in that. And for those of you who are not, there's still plenty of time to sign up. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Yes. Very good. All right. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, boy, that didn't take as long as I thought it was supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, you please, you go ahead. Oh, well, I didn't ask to do that. I didn't well, you know me, I'm an equal opportunity well, guy. I was hoping there was like 90 seconds. Uh, uh, this one's on, we're good. Be because you've heard that we take seriously a neighborhood impact, the, the closest neighbor to maybe any of our campuses really is the Markland facility right here. And even before this campus opened, we started serving them on their 5K race because they started hanging out with us when there was a feats of strength race, when we were raising money for Royal Family Kids Camp. But because of that relationship and the intimacy between Mill Creek's campuses and all of our campuses with them, we, I invited them to make an application for Serve the World. Uh, a, let's be honest, a happy pagan organization. They're not faith-based, but, but a lot of their leadership love Jesus and again, we are, in, we are all about making an impact in our neighborhood. And so the president of that organization put his team on that, and they put together a glorious application. And again, not, not faith-based, and it's not about celebrating their not faith-basedness, but because of the generosity that you saw on those charts, we, we were able as a church to bless Marklin and their new campus that they're building there, two stories a residential day, a, a day center for kids in the elementary school range up into high school that are on the Asperger's or autism spectrum. That building is now under construction or being, the first shovel was dug a couple weeks ago in a presentation that Sterling prayed at. But, but Chapel Street, through Serve the World, gave 
I mean, he, you really did see his jaw hit the ground because he goes to a church and, and he knows how hard it is to keep the church's doors open. And here we gave them $25,000 and said, we love our neighbors and we love what you're doing to minister to special needs. Our special needs ministry, Markland, neighboring Chapel Street, beautiful story of connection, of impact. And again, that's a little bitty story. That, that didn't get uh, $200,000 like Hope for Life in last month of December, you know, the December month giving. But, but it's one little bitty story that you got to hear this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Would any of our other pastors like to get up? By the way, if you, a lot of people have stood up. If you haven't stood up yet, would you? No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, Mike, is, is Amy busy counting? She is? Okay, I'll give her another few minutes. I, w- I wanted to invite uh, Russ. Is Russ crucial here? Russ, where are you? Russ, could you come up, please? And then I need Amy, too, Mike. <laughs> So when you, when you did the vote today for the executive council, what we didn't tell you is, is who was being replaced. Um, one of those individuals is Russ. Russ has been serving on the executive council for six years. Six years. Um, so this is, he has, yes. Thank you. I didn't want, I didn't want to embarrass him, but Russ, this is Russ's role on the council. So we're having a meeting, we're having a discussion. And we're just about done, and Russell goes, "Now, I just just a thought." I, he's, he's, he's very he's very he's the quiet guy that right before you're about to vote, he goes, "Did you think of this one thing?" And then we go on for another hour. But um, no, <laughs> Russ has been very instrumental in, in just giving us the perspective we need uh, on the executive council. Amy, come please come up as well. So we very much appreciate Russ. We do Thank have you. a gift for you, a parting Thank gift, you. and we very much appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> She's actually counting the votes to vote herself off the council. <laughs> not sure it's okay. But Amy has also been serving on the council for six years. And uh, she will remain in service on the nominating committee. Is that correct? Depending on how the vote turns out that you just voted. I'm looking good. You look good. <laughs> I'm looking good. <laughs> she said I'm looking that, good. That has been Amy's role on the executive council. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you very much. We very much appreciate your service. And little Thank, something you. Thank you. Thank you. She's not counting her votes. I just, yeah. I hope. All right. So um, how are we doing back there, Amy? We're getting close? All right. I'll, I'll, um, I'll jump in. I, I was going to save this till the end, but I'll do it now just because there's, there's time now. Uh, and, th- and then I, it'll be brief, but um, one other transition, which some of you know about, and we have a much more significant event planned for is our uh, beloved uh, Chris Saris. Is Chris still here? Yeah. Pastor Chris, uh, of our child- pastor of children's ministries. Um, Chris has been a part of the church since she was a fetus. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, and has seen, I mean, the stories you could tell. As a, as, a, as a little girl in Sunday school, as a volunteer in Sunday school, as a, as a teacher, and as the shepherd leader of that whole department, and what God has done through you um, and in you. Uh, and so I, I want to save it all for when we have, and you'll, if you haven't yet, you'll, you'll see more about the celebration of her tenure and what God's done there, but we just want to say publicly, the gifts are forthcoming at the event, but uh, how much we love you and are grateful for you, because she's, she's been sort of... Uh, in a gradual slope this summer toward full retirement, but this starting September, she's stepping fully off of our staff uh, and into what God has for her next. And we're excited about where God's going to take that ministry, but it's really on your shoulders. And so we want to say we love you and we're grateful. Thank you, Chris. Now, now, just because you stood and applauded, you still have to come to the event when we celebrate yeah. her. And, and There's going to be so much crying. Um, uh, yeah, we have similar stories. Chris and Danny were the first, uh, some of the first families that welcomed us back in 19, 
93 to the church over at South Gibbs. She's also with her family. It's the first time that one of our children went to the hospital. Um, Shane, uh, we were playing in their backyard. Shane threw a ball and hit my kid in the face. So that was, <laughs> thank you for that beautiful memory. And um, we good? <laughs> I got a hundred of them on Chris. I can go all day long. All right, well, at this point, please talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Should be done here in just a minute. Okay, I think we're gonna get out of here at two o'clock, 2.02. I have the official uh, results from the nominating committee um, on the two items relative to the com uh, EC committee. All nominees passed with a greater than 95%. Uh, same thing with the nominating committee, all nominees passed with a greater than 95%. On the budget, the percentage yes was 96.8, so that motion passes. Our 2019-2020 uh, general fund budget will be $5 million. With that, any other questions? All right, if you would, I'll dismiss us in prayer. Thank you. Father, thank you so much for such a beautiful day. And thank you for this church that you've given us. Uh, we, we take it very, very seriously, your commission, your charge. Uh, but mostly just want to thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. Uh, you're a great and wonderful God. And we just appreciate so much uh, you allowing us to be a part of your commission, of, your min of this ministry here. Uh, we thank you for the folks that came today, for their participation, uh, and for their involvement. We just ask that you continue to bless uh, the efforts you've put before us and, and, and all that we do. Uh, we just, we just want to make sure that we always recognize you and give the glory to you. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, folks.